name is Lasse Thomas, and I'm from Queen Mary at the University of London, but you're not here to listen to me. Uh, you may be here to listen to Mark Deveney, but you won't, because he, wouldn't, he wasn't able to make it, uh, but we have a, a, an appropriate substitute. Um, we have three speakers. <laughs> Uh, the first speaker is Yanis Stavakakis, who is professor here at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, uh, and also the leader of the Populismus Project. Um, this, our second speaker is Johannes Angermüller, from, who is professor of um, linguistics, I believe, at University of Warwick. Uh, and then the third speaker today will be uh, Alexandros Kiokulis, um, who is a lecture, senior lecturer here at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. Uh, those of you who know these three guys will know that they are men of many words, but I will insist that they speak for only 20 minutes, and after that we'll have time for questions and discussion. Thank you. Over to you, Jens. Thank you very much, Lasha. My title is Populism and Antipopulism in Times of Crisis, so I will focus on this connection between uh, the opposition, the cleavage between populism and antipopulist discourse, uh, and also the importance of uh, crisis in understanding uh, the articulation of populist discourse and populist mobilizations, um, which is uh, consistent with uh, the aims of the Populismus Project, which I had the opportunity to present to you uh, in the introductory session uh, yesterday. This um, attempt to register the identity difference dimension and study populism together with anti-populism. Uh, this is the first uh, axis which relates to my talk uh, today. And the second is the importance, uh, the role of crisis in understanding populism. Of course, crisis, uh, if I can give a little background uh, the etymological uh, background has to do, it involves two uh, main meanings. One comes from, both emanated from ancient Greece um, and antiquity in general. Uh, crisis refers to juridical judgment or appraisal, decision restoring order, there's a ju juridical aspect, and also there's a medical aspect. And crisis refers to a critical turning point in the development of a disease, after which you either die or get healed. Um, and Gramsci, to bring it closer to hegemony theory and Ernesto Laclau, uh, Ernesto Laclau and uh, Chantal Mouffe's um, orientation, Gramsci manages to somehow combine this idea of a critical emergency emanating from medicine um, with that of a final judgment. Um, and these are combined uh, in his... Uh, take on economic crisis, crisis of meaning, uh, hegemony, cri which become cr hegemony crisis, crisis of the state. And you see a couple of uh, quotations by Gramsci, the very famous one that uh, crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. And also this idea of crisis of authority, crisis of hegemony, crisis of the state, which has to do with the fact that um, a domin the dominant block uh, somehow loses the consent of the people, and that creates this shift from passivity to activity, um, putting forward demands. It's very interesting that the demand, as we heard in the previous session, is the unit of analysis in Ernesto's theory of populism. Uh, so this is, I think, directly related to the idea of an equivalential articulation of these demands into a popular bloc, which uh, functions counter-hegemonically uh, and that is the link between Gramsci and uh, Ernesto. If we move to uh, the theory of populism, we see again uh, a lot of uh, students and analysts and commentators registering the importance of crisis. Paul Taggart is one good case in point, but I prefer uh, Kenneth Roberts um, take on that, and in Kenneth's, um, in Ken's um, theorization of populism, populism is very much related to um, economic or other types of crisis which get translated into a crisis of representation, 
that very often this crisis of political representation involves a crisis of the party system, um, disidentification processes, and that creates, creates a gap that very often is um, covered over, filled in by new uh, political actors um, and very often populist uh, political actors. But uh, recently there is also a shift in the um, relevant literature. So uh, in Robert's account and Taggart, in the usual account, you have crisis as a trigger, as a trigger mechanism for the articulation of populist discourse. More recently, we have a new um, orientation, crisis as performance. And Ben Moffitt is one of the people who have put forward this, uh, this idea. Um, that populism is not only a response to a pre-existing crisis, so it's not only ex an external trigger, but crisis can also be an internal feature of populism, that, that is to say, populism constructs the crisis in a particular way. Maybe, maybe responding to something, to, to a failure that pre-exists, pre constructs the crisis in a particular way. And you see here a very, and that, and that in Moffitt's um, approach involves a performative dimension. So Cry, you see the uh, very uh, useful quote from uh, Moffitt's uh, article, uh, recent article in the go government in opposition, I think it was published. Uh, Cry is a never neutral phenomenon, but must be mediated and pe performed by certain actors. So the idea is that Populist actors uh, often do that. Um, they spectacularize crisis in a particular way that pits the people against the elite and so on and so forth. And the, the um, most radical version of this argument is that populism is actually a cause of crisis. And in his um, recently published book on the Greek crisis and populism, Takis Papas is advancing this particular uh, idea. And you see a quote from that book in a very real sense then, Greece's populist democracy failed because the country's political class gave rational the voters irrational. Again, there's this stress on rationality and irrationality is very interesting. Um, but the idea is that the crisis in Greece has been the outcome of its particular system of populist democracy. So there's obviously a very complex dialectic at play here. Crisis as a trigger, um, crisis as something constructed and performed, and so on and so forth. The question is how best to account for this dialectic. And the second question I'm going to pose is, is this dialectic unique to populism? Should we include it in our minimal criteria, for example? Or is it something that is obviously related, but is not? peculiar to populism. It's a much wider phenomenon that affects many different ideologies, discourses, movements, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think a very useful um, input into this discussion can be found in Colin Hayes' uh, work, in which he tries to combine uh, these two aspects, so, um, and he tries to attach different concepts so for Colin Hay, there, there are obviously moments and instances of failure, of economic failure, social failure, and so on and so forth. But then this failure is constructed in a particular way by different political projects. And crisis is the name of this construction. And you see here a quote by, uh, by Colin Hay. Um, crisis and failure simply cannot be, crisis are representations and hence constructions of failure. And there's also a competition between different constructions of failure. Now, within the framework of uh, our project, the association between uh, crisis and populism is mainly researched with reference to uh, Laclau's conceptualization of dislocation as the negative twin of his central concept of discursive articulation. So, um, and here, Laclau registers the dual character of dislocation. Dislocations are, um, uh, on the one hand, threatening identities. They have to do with a certain instance of failure. But on the other hand, by creating a lack 
they, develop, they, they stimulate the desire for new identity construction. And this construction, the articulation of new discourses responding to dislocations, involves, often involves a mythical, this is the concept of myth that uh, Laclau develops in New Reflection the Revolution of Our Time, um, involves a mythical uh, narration of the crisis and of the proposed solutions, which compete for hegemony with other discursive articulation within an antagonistic context. And you see, a couple of quotes by Ernesto on the importance of crisis. Already from the 70s, it was something that on which he had uh, decided, uh, he had um, something that he highlighted in his uh, theorization of populism. And it is something that even more stressed in his work uh, in 2005. And this is very interesting, something that Moffitt does not really take into account, that uh, Ernesto also uh, includes a lot of reference to this performative dimension. So, so actually you have this location, but then you have this mythical um, construction uh, of crisis, which is performed. And you see here a quote from the populist region in which this performative, and this is a shift, you see a shift, for, uh, uh, that's why I stressed uh, Takis Papas' um, uh, account in which Rationality and irrationality is very prominent. Uh, populism has some sort of irrational uh, response. And you see here the difference. This is, a, uh, this is an orientation that moves beyond this rationality, rationality position and uh, focuses on this attributive performative function of uh, populist uh, discursive articulation and populist mobilization. Now, Coming to the second question I um, posed, it is clear that the importance of constructions of crisis, uh, 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 construction of crisis are not unique to populism. Um, and Colin Hay, I mean, I could also refer to, uh, to the work I have uh, done in my PhD with, uh, with Ernest, which was an analysis of green ideology and green ideological discourse. And there, the concept of dislocation was central because my argument was that the emergence of green ideology presupposes a dual dislocation, dislocation of the dominant modern conceptualization of nature as a resource, and then the dislocation of the radical tradition in the West in the 60s. We have May 68, uh, uh, people get disillusioned with the uh, Soviet model, and these two dislocations uh, somehow combined can explain the articulation of green ideological discourse. But uh, so probably this importance of crisis and dislocation is important for other types of discourses. And Colin Hay um, is very useful here again because he has published a, a, an article about Thatcherism and the winter of discontent. And of course, according to Stuart Hall, Thatcherism is also populist, but I don't think it is populist in, if, if we follow Ernesto's criteria. So I will not here consider it uh, as, as, as populist discourse. Uh, but you can see here in uh, Colin Hay's uh, analysis how Thatcherism has used and has constructed crisis and has performed crisis in a way which has furthered the neoliberal project, the neoliberal hegemony. So my conclusion from that um, is that uh, crisis can be constructed, can be performed in a way benefiting neoliberal discourses, green ideological discourse, all types of different discourses, so it is not unique to populism. Now, in our, in our case studies, uh, both uh, in our qualitative uh, research and other types of research we have, uh, we have employed, we see again how economic and social dislocations, for example, Argentina's default in the early 2000s to the Greek debt de crisis within the last few years, have indeed triggered a crisis of representation that served as the springboard for populist politicizations. And here the emergence of uh, movements like Podemos and uh, Syriza, as well as the long hegemony of populist uh, governance like the one led by the Kirchners, uh, cannot, uh, obviously cannot be properly interpreted without taking into account this um, prior dislocation. In addition, the antagonistic type of politicization put forward by populist political actors 
constructs and performs the crisis in a particular confrontational way in a bid to represent marginalized popular demands. So you have crisis as trigger, but you also ha obviously have crisis as something constructed and performed in a particular way. Uh, in fact, the, the ensuing intensification of discursive struggles between populism and anti-populism may indicate the development of a political culture modeled on radical, participatory, or agonistic democracy at the expense of liberal, deliberative, consensual, uh, or elitist versions of the democratic ideal. And this is often construed, so, so you have crisis as trigger, you have the performance of crisis, you have an antagonism between populist and anti-populist uh, readings of this crisis, and you have a politicization put forward by uh, populist actors, which is often construed as a new crisis itself by anti-populist discourse, both academic and political. Some further examples from our uh, research, uh, um, the People's Party in the States was uh, actually uh, emerged, was its discourse was articulated within the context of very, very deep social, economic and social dislocation. You see here a populist cartoon from the 1890s, and it's, very, it's a very similar situation to what we are experiencing today. Uh, this is a farmer, a, labor, a laborer, uh, heavily indebted, um, and the cartoon also constructs the crisis, responds to this crisis, but also constructs the crisis in a very particular way. This construction is also depicted here. This is a solution put forward by the People's Party. This is the, presidential, the populist presidential ticket in the 1892 elections. And you see the solution here, which is a mythical solution in the in Ernesto sense, equal rights to all, special privileges to none. And the anti-populist backlash, this is an anti-populist cartoon, which tries to associate uh, populism with all sorts of uh, problems, sectionalism, discontent, demagogism, prejudice, and so on and so forth. To move to a more recent example, uh, the Greek case, I will not say uh, many things because uh, Yorgos will present uh, this case in detail later on. Uh, again, here we have a very deep social and economic crisis, social dislocation, economic dislocation. We have the collapse, not only crisis of representation, we have the collapse the liquidation of the party system within the Greek context. And uh, the response to that is the articulation of a populist discourse on behalf of Syriza, which uh, you see here the uh, results it managed to get in the various elections, and um, eventually leading to uh, the 25th Janu uh, January 2015 elections and the uh, government uh, coalition between Syriza uh, and Anel. So you have a populist uh, response that creates again an anti-populist backlash. So we have populism and anti-populism together. Syriza, the Syriza project has been uh, from the beginning targeted and demonized as irresponsibly and dangerously populist. I have a, a quote from the Spiegel here. Uh, Tsipras among the 10 most dangerous politicians in Europe on the basis of his populism, uh, which is not a surprise. Populism has been declared as the main enemy of the European Union. Uh, at the same time, crisis is constructed, obviously, in a particular way in Syriza's discourse, constructed and performed in a particular way, which attributes to both internal and external causes, which are illustrated as enemies, uh, all these deep social and economic dislocations, an internal and external troika about which Syriza had been speaking. Uh, and this construction manages to hegemonize the field uh, against other constructions of the crisis. At the same time, to go back to my initial framework, the ensuing hegemony involves a repoliticization which is very different from the dominant post-democratic background. And here I think what happened yesterday, the announcement of a referendum, is very much relevant. Uh, and the way this is denounced as something that should not be allowed, that is not democratic, we have a very different conceptualization of what democracy is and what democracy involves. 
So this is a politicization which the anti-populist camp will construct as a crisis, as a crisis of democracy, not as a solution, not as a de democratic solution of sorts, but as a crisis. Coming to my conclusion, the confrontation between populism and anti-populism emerges, I think, through all that as a crucial ideolo ideological cleavage within uh, the crisis-ridden Greek public sphere and beyond. On the one hand, as it was to be expected, the demands of social strata and citizens that uh, go through a violent downward uh, social mobility are gradually articulated within a framework of demands that pits the people against dominant and European political and economic elites. On the other hand, being unable and reluctant to productively register and sublimate the populace, sticking to what uh, Nikos was talking earlier about this neoliberal uh, hegemony, sticking to this business as usual strategy, which magnifies relations of inequality and popular resentment, these elites seem to ignore the popular, reducing it to its populist equivalent in the pejorative sense. Behind the polarization between populist and anti-populist tendencies and the different construction of the crisis, what, what is, I think, increasingly at stake uh, in this ensuing antagonism is our democratic future in Europe and beyond. The choice between a post-democratic elitist mutation of the representative system and its often clumsy and impure and certainly performatively invested participatory repolitization. Thank you very much. You don't have a PowerPoint? No. <coughs> just close it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Johannes Engermüller. I'm a discourse researcher in the UK and France with a background in sociology and linguistics. I currently work mainly on questions of academic discourse, science and technology studies. So that's why I'm a bit peripheral maybe to the question of populism. However, I feel very close to the general discourse theoretical questions as they're discussed in the Essex School of Germany and, um, and in general to questions of discourse research as um, they're treated in the Populismus Project. Um, what I want to do in this talk is to talk very briefly about academic discourse and certain aspects um, phenomena you can see in, among researchers as they use language in, in research and then try to apply this idea of how academic discourse works to what we now see on the European scene around the Greek debt, debt crisis, especially in the last few months um, uh, around um, the new S S Syriza government. And, um, and against this background, I want to come back to the question that we had discussed yesterday um, in the presentation of the Populismus Project um, on the difference between words, words like people, populism, um, which can be counted in corpus analysis, and the practical uses that can be made of words such as people, populism, and many other words in order to categorize and label certain people as populist um, or the people or speaking the name of people. Um, let me start with a few um, remarks on my theoretical background. Um, I, I have long worked on questions of post-structuralist discourse theory and uh, I have benefited from uh, Anas Laclau's contributions um, to social and political theory, um, especially with re uh, regard to the question of the social as something discursively constituted. Against the discourse theoretical background, the social is not just out there as a constituted structure, but it is constantly articulated, rearticulated through discursive practices. Um, and also, subjects, actors are not just there entering discourse, pursuing certain ideas and strategies, and um, well, then using discourse to get them across, but rather 
the other way around, actors are, are an effect of discursive practices of discourse. Um, well, this is probably very familiar. I also draw on pragmatic and praxeological tendencies, which have not been very much received in the context of political sciences. And uh, for example, interactional ethnomethodological approaches in sociology, pragmatic approaches in um, French linguistics, uh, enunciated for pra pragma pragmatics concerning the, the use of language. And from this point of view, uh, discourse denotes a symbolically mediated process between people. It sounds a bit different. In fact, uh, as I hope you will see, it's not that different. In many ways, um, the theoretical backgrounds are quite similar, even though there's hardly any overlap. And um, so from a praxeological point of view, discourse is a situated practice of two or more people who use language to define their relationships and identities. And uh, this is um, the background of um, how we work on academic discourse in, in the Disconnects project at Warwick and Ecole d'Institut. We consider academic discourse, that is what researchers do in their everyday lives, as a positioning practice of researchers who use language to create and occupy certain subject positions. So the idea is that as researchers publish, um, give talks, um, interact with other people through language, they not only convey ideas about what they want to get across, but they also define their positions, their roles, their places vis-a-vis -vis other researchers. And this is something which is unavoidable. It is not strategic, it's something which they just do, and in many cases without really reflecting on it. Um, well, of course, people try to come up with theories and uh, try to anticipate certain reactions, but this is not really something that they um, have in mind when they enter discourse, because their goal, of course, is to get across certain ideas. So the idea in the Disconnects project is to, to account for discourse as a positioning practice, um, which um, is kind of fundamental for all those who are involved in this practice, because as a result of these positioning practices of many people entering this discourse, certain people can occupy certain subject positions, become visible, recognized as researchers, and uh, more than others. So um, if we have a look at academic discourse and, and ask, well, how do we occupy these different subject positions available for researchers. Um, of course, uh, the first thing we may think of is that there's this formal institutional order of subject positions, um, which you all know, like professors, um, lecturers, students. And now, of course, many people who take part in research as this practice, um, they gravitate around these formally um, defined institutional pr uh, pr positions. But that's not the whole story. Um, as they try to find their places in these institutional positions, they engage in all kinds of very elaborate practices using language, like publications, giving talks, talking to people, writing emails, letters of recommendation, all kinds of things, which help them to define their places with other people uh, around these institutional positions. And, um, and as a result of these many practices of using language, um, they're, they're informal positions which emerge over time. And researchers build up their, their reputation um, as specialists, for example, of discourse theory. And if we take the example of Laclau, um, you could see, of course, how he moved up uh, the institutional ladder. But then, I mean, that's not the whole story. He also became very well known as a pro proponent of a certain um, discourse uh, theoretical approach, uh, which, which we all know. And, um, and the question is, how did he become um, the holder of such a subject position? Yeah, the founder or one of the proponents of discourse theory. And here we need to think of the many debates that have taken place. Um, I remember, for example, a debate between Bhaskar, uh, social realism, and Laclau. Um, there are other debates, Laclau and Musilis. Um, and there are also many other uh, relationships which were uh, created in a more personal way. Uh, for example, between uh, Laclau and his students um, from Greece, from Germany, from Denmark. And, 
And so there are all kinds of practices where relationships between one person, Laclau, and others are defined over time. Um, and, and in a way, this constitutes the very specific subject position that he is known for, right? Um, the founder of Essex School of Hegemony Theory. Um, now the point is, of course, that this is not something which he just had strategically in mind. This is an effect of many people interacting in a discursive economy, where all people kind of take part in these positioning practices. So it's just as much an effect of all other people in this social space of research reacting to, um, to whatever uh, Laclau said or, or published. And, and the point now is that we need time, that there are certain processes, practices, that lead to a certain order where certain people can occupy these uh, positions. And, um, and so we need to be aware, of, of course, of the very specific debates between certain people uh, where many people have reacted then and created um, the subject position which um, has given a certain visibility to Laclau. Now, this is a very brief kind of uh, presentation of the model. And what I now want to do is to apply this idea, uh, which basically draws from post-structuralist ideas about fluid kind of um, social orders in the making, uh, but also from praxeological insights into discourse as a process, right, as, as a symbolically mediated process of um, relationship building between people. And now apply this model to what we see today um, um, in the debate about the Greek debt crisis. In fact, um, this idea that uh, whenever we talk and use language, we also take part in certain positioning practices, that's something we, of course, see in many areas of social life. Um, this is something which is very kind of everyday-like. And, um, and it also happens in, in this debate, which we, which we, which we see currently um, in, in, on the European scene. And um, what we've seen in the last few months and, yeah, the last five years um, between certain actors on the European level and the Greek government is um, some kind of um, theater, a debate where people take position, uh, make claims, um, say many things about each other, and one can imagine maybe different readings of, of this theater, of this discourse, of this debate. And, um, and, well, this is to underline that, of course, there are different readings uh, from what's happening, from, um, from the reading that I want to, to suggest that is this positioning idea of uh, discourse as, as a practice. And, uh, well, the first idea, which I think might be totally um, uh, legitimate, is a realist reading. Um, you have this theater of discourse, but behind there's a certain structure um, a certain order, a certain law, which um, is just there, and basically um, uh, discourse basically will at some point just um, um, fulfill what is there already. And, um, and of course, I mean, there's some good reason to believe that this is indeed the case if we think of um, the strong pressures on all participants of this very emotional debate to create as much fuss, emotion, and um, noise as possible. I mean, um, whatever the result, at some point, it will be very painful for everybody. And so um, I guess um, there's some reason to believe that at some point they just need to stage this crisis, yeah, as, as Yanis just uh, said, um, in order to, to legitimate certain decisions and um, to um, make rational and accountable for uh, what, whatever they do. Um, there might be a second reading, which um, could also see some kind of justification for. Um, that is an idealist reading of this discourse, this debate, as some kind of exchange between certain approaches to economic policy, for example, and um, a certain idea of how to run societies, yeah, a more solidary one, a more kind of um, exclusive, uh, neoliberal one. And in fact, I mean, there might be some reasons to, to believe that it's about the circulation and establishment of certain ideologies. And, um, and I think it's interesting if, if you have a look at the German debate on 
on this um, um, uh, on this crisis. There's a very very strong discourse of rescuing Greece. Rescuing Greece, which basically is quite ambivalent because it will come from very different camps. Uh, well, not only um, from the kind of standard mainstream um, conservative kind of camp, which um, uh, which tries to avoid talking about the banks which have been saved, right? <laughs> but uh, trying to displace this discussion towards saving Greece, which is, of course, not the same thing. Um, but also from, from the left um, and much more um, uh, supportive um, uh, camp, which is not that small. I mean, especially if you, if you think of um, the three left parties, they've always been in support of a much more solidary approach to, to, to the Greek debt crisis, and um, they've long had a majority in parliament. Um, and for them, too, it's about rescuing Greece. And, of course, I mean, it's interesting to see how these formula can translate very kind of hidden agendas and, um, and without the actors really uh, knowing about them. So I'm not saying that discourse does not um, hide certain power games. I'm not saying discourse um, uh, does not trans transmit or convey certain ideas. But I now want to point out the crucial effects that these debates have, whatever these kind of power backgrounds and ideas involved, on the positioning of the various actors in this discourse. And what I find extremely interesting in this debate is how certain posi positions have changed over time. And I think extremely interesting is the case of Merkel. Merkel has, of course, she occupies an institutional position, right, like the academics, occupying a certain professorship, um, let's say for political science. And, um, and over time, you see there's all kinds of categorization, labeling processes going on, which have changed in a way, or created something new. And, um, and over time, in this debate, Merkel comes to speak for much more than just the German national position, there's this kind of informal position that is created, which um, is the kind of standard mainstream European position. It's very clear she not only speaks for, for the German government, but for many more governments. And this is an effect of this extreme type of debate which we've seen in the last few years. And it's... It's, it's theater, but it leads to, 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 to new situation and to, to new social roles, and, and this creates powerful positions, this kind of in, in, informal position of Merkel as a European leader, having a certain say and representing certain kind of um, positions in this debate. Of course, the same is true for, for Tsipras, and um, I think yesterday's decision to go for a, a referendum is very significant. Um, this will change the kind of uh, way that um, Tsipras is categorized, seen as, as a national and European leader. And, and I think if Tsipras is considered as a populist leader that is labeled, categorized, positioned as a populist in this European framework, it is because of this showdown which has been staged between Merkel representing a mainstream kind of neoliberal European position and the guy who, yeah, who's against that. And, and this, is, this is a very powerful configuration, and everybody acknowledges it, um, that this is something which has become real in a way, even though it's nowhere institutional. I mean, you correct me, you are the political scientist, right? Um, and, and at the same time, it will really change the way that certain decisions are, are made. And then this, of course, reminds us that these informal positions that are created in discourse over time in these processes between certain people and actors, um, they create informal, I mean, there, there are certain informal positions bubbling up in this process, which then can have effects on the institutional framework. Because, of course, in, in research as well, you have these very powerful informal positions, like, I mean, like Lau, I mean, he's, he's been extremely visible, even though he's dead. I mean, that's, um, I think, the point. You don't even have to live anymore. And, 
And at some point, this can have some very significant effects on the institutional structures. So, in fact, both orders are rather dynamic and fluid, and they depend on each other. And the same is true, in a way, on the European level. You have a kind of institutional framework of formally defined positions with certain rights. It's not only governments, of course. I mean, there are all kinds of different uh, actors uh, which are constructed as actors. Um, and then there are these informal things which just emerge over time, like being leaders of this, in this, uh, or pr protagonists in this showdown yeah, between the mainstream and, um, and the populist. And, um, and this may have some effects at some point um, on, on the institutional structure in Europe. I think what we see here in these um, debates is they try to test certain new institutional possibilities and we definitely see something like a new public sphere with new subject positions bubbling up. And um, at some point, this is likely to, to be transformed in, in some, some sort of new institutional positions. I mean, this is still too new, but well, we'll see. I want to conclude now. Um, in this paper, I wanted to outline an approach to discourse as a positioning practice um, of certain participants of discourse in large um, populations, right? It's not about just individuals, it's, it's about people talking in large kind of communities. Um, and this is uh, something where certain post-structuralist insights, um, the kind of subjectivity as an effect of discursive practice, social order as a non-constituted um, order structure, um, is opened with, by, by the help of praxeological insights which point out that you need certain processes which really take place to establish certain positions. And it's not just there, you need this time to, to make these things exist and real for others. And um, so this implies that social order is discursively constituted. Yeah, it's not just there and then discourse is taken up to, to, um, to confirm this order. Um, this means that what happens in these debates is, of course, political, it's open. You have social practices which cannot be un, uh, reduced to an underlying law or structure. And also, you can't really reduce what's happening to the circulation of ideas. And many people from outside discourse studies sometimes say, well, discourse people are these people just studying ideas, which is not true. Um, but at least not for, for how I understand discourse studies. Um, the idea is that um, it is in these interchanges, exchanges between certain discourse participants where there are certain claims which are made about ideas that, um, that certain positions and places are constructed. And so it's much more about the, the construction of certain relevant, powerful positions than about what, is, what they say. And in that sense, I would say I would um, be critical of, of, of a hegemonic approach which sees discourse as the kind of articulation of ideas. It's much more about the articulation of certain subject positions and giving visibility and legitimacy to certain participants of academic discourse and not to others. There might be a few misunderstandings to these very kind of spontaneous ideas and I'd like to dissipate um, them just in case they have emerged. First of all, insisting on the anti-foundationalist nature of discourse. This does not mean that power is not central. On the contrary, of course, I mean, it's about power. And the question is, of course, how participants enter this game of positioning from certain unequally defined power positions in view of constructing um, new hierarchies or reproducing certain inequalities. So it's really about um, accounting for power inequalities as they, they are re-articulated in these discursive practices. And the second thing I want to emphasize, and this is really my last sentence, if I emphasize the role of practices and processes between participants of discourse, um, this does not imply a return to the actor, but it's much more about um, the autonomy of practices of practices which constitute subject positions, which are then kind of, uh, which then play certain people as, um, as important actors in, in, in discourse. So um, yeah, that's my little reflection on, on discourse studies and um, the current Greek debt crisis. Thank you.
Santos. Um, so we decided that uh, I will fill in this slot that was left empty by uh, Mark Denevi, who couldn't make it in the end, uh, because it, was, it would give us the chance to talk about a phenomenon, a recent political phenomenon that we have uh, mentioned yesterday. And, uh, yeah. uh, yeah. and perhaps will be brought up again. Uh, during the conference, and this is the case of Podemos as a form of uh, contemporary left-wing populism. So this is a paper that I, I wrote a couple of months ago, but I think it is still relevant, at least the main part of it. So uh, Podemos is one of the two main peaks of a new wave of left-wing populism that has emerged in contemporary Europe, main in the cri mainly in the crisis hit north, and like a series of them give, gives the light to a conventional wisdom of political science about contemporary European populism, which is usually presented as reactionary, nationalist, xenophobic, exclusionary, and anti-European. Podemos embraces the project of a politically integrated and solidary Europe. It stands up for socially marginalized sectors and presses a strong social rights agenda. Moreover, and this is particularly interesting for our project, it articulates a populist discourse and pursues a populist political strategy understood in Ernesto Laclau's term in a way that demonstrates to some extent the efficacy of this conception of populism in the context of uh, the cri contemporary crisis of democracy. And I will start with this, how uh, Podemos populism is a, is a response to the contemporary crisis of democracy uh, in Spain. Over the last five years, the trajectory of democratic politics in Spain shows clear similar similarities with sociopolitical developments in countries like Greece since the year 2010 or in the late 80s in Venezuela. Spanish society was like, likewise affected by a severe crisis of legitimation of the liberal democratic consensus that had prevailed in the previous two decades. The 78 regime that was put in place after the fall of Fra Franco's dictatorship has undergone the same post-democratic unraveling of, of liberal democracy. That means that a regime that was determined by the alternation of a center-left and a center-right party in power, the commitment to financial capitalism, the demobilization of citizens, the avoidance of deep political conflict, witnessed furthermore since the, the, the 90s a programmatic convergence of mainstream parties on the neoliberal consensus, a gradual ossification of political institutions, a widespread corruption, and a rising disaffection of popular majorities with formal representative democracy. Popular discontent has, discontent has been increasing in recent years as a consequence of the way ruling elites have managed the economic crisis since 2008. The popular 15th May movement, which spread across Spain in May 2011, expressed this widespread sentiment of collective outrage at the crisis of democracy and material impoverishment. This collective mobilization has left a strong imprint of political culture, diffusing its radical critique of the status quo and aggra aggravating its crisis of legitimization, projecting lay people as the sovereign agent in democratic politics and uh, spreading its aspirations to enhance popular participation. The movement, however, failed to initiate a process of building new democratic institutions in sustainable terms and also failed to gain leverage on established institutions. As a result, certain social actors felt in the year 2013 or 2014 the need for a new instrument of political representation which, is, which would overcome the fragmentation and political impotence of the movements, organizing them and gaining access to power in order to reclaim the institutions of political power in the interest of popular majorities. This was precisely the rationale of the agenda that was endorsed by a sector of social actors who were engaged in civil citizens' initiatives in 2014, including Podemos, Ganemos, and PA, which is another formation against um, defending the right to housing. These formations opted for hybrid schemes of action and structure in order to both uphold and sustain grassroots mobilization and to pursue institutional interventions and the electoral route. 
In addition to the common background, that is the, the organic crisis of liberal democracy and the trajectory from a popular outrage to the search for a new collective representative, Syriza, Venezuela's uh, Chavismo and the Spanish Podemo, Podemos share also a populist logic which can be grasped in the terms of Ernesto Laclau. At the core of Podemos' discourse lies an antagonistic divide between the social majority and the privileged minority, which displaces in their discourse uh, and replaces the divide between left and right. The social majority, which is de designated in their discourse as la gente, la mayoría social, la ciudadanía, is represented as suffering from poverty and exclusion from a democracy which is uh, said to be hijacked by elites. And this popular majority is opposed to the casta which rules the regime and appropriates its benefits. Moreover, a plurality of social demands claiming the right to employment, housing, social protection, health, education, the cancellation of, of the adjust debt, the end of, of austerity policies, and the, restora the restoration of popular sovereignty are made equivalent and they are brought together in a single chain of equivalence around the empty signifier of democracy and the charismatic figure of a leader, Pablo Iglesias. The third co component of a populist configuration, according to Laclau, is also evidently present. Podemo strives to construct a popular unity and to recuperate politics for the dispossessed majority in order to put the institutions in the service of the common good. Now, what I'm going to do in the rest of my presentation is to focus on three features that, in my view, partly differentiate Podemos as an instance of populist politics from the cases of both Syriza and Venezuela's uh, Chavismo. What distinguishes Podemos in comparison to Chavismo at the, at the beginning, at least, of its, uh, uh, of its trajectory, and Syriza as well, is a more intimate relationship with democratic movements. This new Spanish party is largely a product of an outcome of the shifts in political culture that have been brought about by the 15th May movement and its epigons. The, the, these shifts focus on the protagonism of the people in opposition to the elites, the demand for transparency and accountability in governance, the promotion of an open and plural participation of citizens, participation of citizens in the exercise of power. These critical ideas are constitutive of the discursive practice of Podemos and they explain its majoritarian resonance with the population. Podemos, moreover, has promoted an open and plural engagement of common people in its grassroots. It has set up, at the, from the beginning, local and sectorial circles of members and sympathizers who debate politics and put forward policy proposals facilitating also an online, online forms of involvement that are accessible to all. At the beginning also of Podemos, it pursued the participatory construction of its program for the European elections in May 2014 and of its electoral list. On the other hand, Podemos was launched from the top at the initiative of a single person, Pablo Iglesias, an affiliated group of intellectuals and activists. This leadership has always maintained a directive role in the politics of the new organization and its public representation, emphasizing the need for coherence and efficiency in the party line, emphasizing also the importance of the electoral route and of conquering the state in order to achieve democratic transformations. This persistence of hierarchy, state politics and intensive mediatic communication signals the survival of all style representative politics and a strong vertical dimension in the midst of Podemos, who it seems to be at odds with a horizontal dimension of open egalitarian participation. This dualism of Podemos populism reflects the complexity, ambiguity and heterogeneity of contemporary society and politics in Spain. On the one hand, democratic mobilizations since 2011 have fashioned, have created a new common sense which challenges conventional representative politics. On the other hand, state institutions remain in place, resisting popular pressures and repressing political uh, contestation. Moreover, the broad diffusion of a radical democratic common sense has failed to trigger a corresponding expansion of active involvement in participatory politics. Social diversity and fragmentation, the lack of effective coordination among local movements, along with 
limited participation in popular assemblies have not made possible the constitution of alternative democratic institutions which would replace existing institutions in the management of collective affairs. The need to gain some impact and power in the, in the current institution of power in order to meet popular demands. The need to create, construct a coherent alternative discourse that can win over electoral majorities. And the endurance of the social habitus of political delegation and minimal participation mean that today vertical organization is pertinent in order to attain the wish for political results. If effectively sustained, this combination of vertical coordination and representation with open egalitarian participation may help to advance the project of a radical democracy of uh, social movements and, and citizens under the current uh, conditions of impurity and variety, where the old has not definitely passed away and the new is struggling to emerge and constitute itself. Now, the second uh, distinct element of Podemos, partly at least, is that it moves toward a process of making representative politics common in two ways. First, the absence of professional politicians from the rank of Podemos, the formation of circles which enable the citizens to engage themselves directly in a common political project, the organic links with social movements and the open primary elections for the selection of party candidates transform political representation, which now becomes a business of any interested citizen rather than only of professional politicians and other elites. Second, the discourse of Podemos draws on the common sense of Spanish political culture, both older and new, walking in the footsteps of the 15th May movement and its distinctive discourse Podemos articulates a diagnostic narrative for the present crisis and puts forward uh, policy alternatives using a plain language to which people can uh, easily relate. Both the co but the common sense encompasses, of course, both reactionary and advanced democratic elements. So, in opposing the la gente to the casta, in defending public goods, in arguing for accountability and people's power, Podemos' discourse seeks to re-articulate uh, this common sense in Spanish society in ways that both engage majorities and promote democratic change, trying to navigate the course between reactionary conservatism and, and an attractive extreme radicalism. In this regard, the populist vocabulary of Podemos does not only democratize political discourse by interacting with an existing political community, but also strives to bring it to be, into being a new majoritarian community, a new political front that would be hegemonized by Podemos. Now, the third interesting feature, and perhaps it's the, most, the third distinctive feature, and perhaps it's the most interesting from our perspective, it is that Laclau's theory of populism for Podemos is not merely and an analytic tool for uh, uh, making sense of Podemos politics, but also <coughs> along with the, the political culture of the uh, 15th May movement and the Latin American experiences of left-wing populism in the last 15 years, it is one of the key intellectual influences on the political project of Podemos. Podemos can be seen to this extent as partly an implementation of Laclau's theory. This reflexive application of populism is apparently without known precedent in the history of populist politics, and it exemplifies the kind of social reflexivity that Anthony Giddens, among others, has attributed to modernity. This is the idea that scientific knowledge of social practices is inserted into the practices themselves as it is used to reflect upon the social practices and to transform them. Consequently, social theories become themselves subject to contest and revision insofar as their own interaction, intervention in social realities, changes unpredictably the very object of, the study, of their study. The short life of Podemos and its reflexive populism does not allow any secure appreciation of the effects of such reflexivity at this early stage. It is possible, however, to advance a set, a set of hypothetical claims, responding partly to critical remarks that have been made about the impact of Laclau's theory on Podemos. The first claim is that Laclau's influence is bound to assign a primary place to the, place to the people over class or other collective subjects. 
In this regard, the extra extraordinary success of Podemos at the beginning seems to confirm that the pertinence of this strategic choice are the conditions of widespread social heterogeneity and fragmentation. On the other hand, the claim that Laclau's populist hegemony moderates political radicalism, keeping it within the confines of existing liberal democracies, is, I think, ill-founded. The politics of hegemony concerns, as we know, the constitution of social orders themselves, the formation of new social orders or, or the defense of established social orders. Laclau, moreover, does not dismiss revolution in the sense of the institution of new social orders around new social principles. What he rejects is the idea of a definitely emancipated society which is fully reconciled with itself. The most interesting implication, now moving to the end of this presentation, seems to be that a certain understanding of Laclau's theory, which elevates charismatic leaders to a key a dimension of effective populism is likely to have reinforced vertical tendencies in Podemos, whereby leaders direct their parties in a top-down and uh, exclusionary and authoritarian style. This reception of Laclau's hegemony is likely to have been affirmed by the experience of Latin American left-wing populism, which also is in, has an influence on the political directors of Podemos. The Citizens' Assembly in November 2014 marked, according to many critics, a vertical turn in the actual operations and the formal constitution of Podemos that was laid down in this assembly. The leadership of Pablo Iglesias and his allies sought to consolidate its position as the head of the party, putting to vote complete lists of candidates for the executive and the supervising national committees of the party, as well as final documents for the organizational structure, the political principle, and the ethics of Podemos, which were all ratified as a whole and block by eligible members. This tactic seemed to enact a plebiscita plebiscitarian relationship between the leader and his mass followers, who were invited to simply ratify his decisions. The trend towards hierarchy centralization is brought into relief also if we compare the organizational scheme that was put forward by Iglesias and his faction to the only alternative draft that was submitted by another group. The first the first document that was, final, that was proposed by Pablo Iglesias and was finally ratified in the Assembly re-established the traditional position of the General Secretary with decisive capacities to act as the representative of the party, the general representative of the party, to secure the cohesion of the party strategy, and so on. By contrast, the alternative scheme allowed for three national spokespersons and not and in general secretary, and strictly limited the power of all party officers. A final, now, prevalence of vertical hegemony over horizontal plurality and autonomy is likely to ruin the prospects of Podemos as an instrument of popular empowerment and democratization, even if it achieves electoral success in the short term. And apparently, from the beginning of 2015, it seems that it has also, it has also had an effect on its electoral success, success and its um, uh, popularity, which has declined and uh, has been stabilized and is now uh, fighting with three other forces for the first position in the polls and the national elections. And even the electoral victories that it, uh, it, it had in, um, in the last uh, regional elections were always in coalition with other forces, where it put for, it puts its own candidates, in most cases it lost. Now, despite ap appearance to the contrary, however, the dominance of vertical politics is not, in my view, an obvious effect of Laclau's theory. Laclau has claimed, indeed, that the symbolic unifi the unification of the group around an individuality is inherent to the formation of a people. But he clarified that this symbolic unification around the person of a leader does not amount necessarily to sovereign rule by the leader. The difference between, he says, I quote, the difference between that situation of sovereign rule by a person and the one, this, and the one that we are discussing is that Hobbes, because he, he discusses this issue in uh, relation to Hobbes, Hobbes is talking about actual ruling, whereas we, like Lau, are talking about constituting a signifying totality and the latter does not automatically lead to the former. So he means that for him, the important role of the leader is to act as a symbol of unity and, 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 and a nodal point in a signifying totality. This does not necessarily mean for Laclau that the leader has to act as a sovereign ruler. 
In effect, the conception of hegemony in the radical democratic project that Laclau and Muth uh, uh, discuss when presenting hegemony and social strategy champions a pluralism that contests the prevalence of any single political logic and pleads for a constructive synthesis among multiple and conflicting logics, especially among autonomy and hegemony or horizontalism and verticalism. Addressing the apparent dichotomy, autonomy and hegemony, Laclau and Muth argue that the coexistence of two different and contradictory social logics existing in the form of a mutual limitation of their effects is perfectly possible. Much more than a mere concession for them, this moment of tension, I quote, the moment of tension, the moment of openness, which gives the social its essentially incomplete and precarious character, is what every project of radical democracy should set out to institutionalize. So their actual argument in terms of radical democracy is that this should combine uh, different and, complete and competing logic, the logic of autonomy and the logic of hegemony, rather than stabilizing and establishing a single logic, either the logic of hegemony or the logic of autonomy. And I'm moving now, I'm closing now this uh, presentation. Under the present post-political conditions, which are of, uh, of democracy and the crisis of legitimation, which is challenged by social mobilizations and popular aspirations to empower democracy, it seems that this uneasy, ambiguous combination of verticalism and horizontalism, that is, of cohesion, efficiency, representation, majoritarian politics on the one hand, and direct collective uh, participation, grassroots initiatives, rejection of hierarchies on the other hand, promises to open ways forward by successfully negotiating ambivalent conditions in which the old has not died yet and the, and the new struggles to assert and to constitute itself. So, thank you. Thanks very much.